Hello. Now we're going to discuss some procedures associated with field work. Field work is very necessary for many of the projects that we do, and it is a serious business. It does involve risks, and it does involve care with what one does to ensure that there aren't adverse consequences with it. So field work is a serious business. It is no joyride, but of course, despite that, it can be great fun. So what are the risks in the field? Well, there are risks associated with sustaining injury, which of course could be fatal if you fall off a cliff or something, or run over by a bus or whatever. Uh, there may be a need for emergency medical care if something happens associated with uh, illness, infirmity or injury. There can be conditions where the situation locally is unstable and one suffers violence or threats, for example, violent robbery, or one is in a situation that's highly polarised and simply dangerous from this point of view. And one could get lost, marooned, stranded or even kidnapped in some parts of the world, for example, where travel arrangements fail or again where there are uh, risks associated with the breakdown of social order. And that might involve a need for specialised health care or for rescue or even for being repatriated in some form. Most of the time, of course, none of this really applies and fieldwork is pretty safe. But you don't want to be in a situation where there are these difficulties and where um, you're reliant on help, especially if it's likely to fail. So it's a good idea to look at the risks in the field and to uh, assess them in such a way that you are prepared to reduce them and tackle them if there is um, some likelihood of something happening. So um, it's worth reviewing your research strategy, your field strategy, to ensure that there is no likelihood or a very low likelihood that you cause injury or offence to other people. For example, offence to people you are interviewing. Um, injury, I think, is less likely if you are merely doing uh, uh, questionnaire-type surveys. But uh, if, if, uh, if not, then... Uh, for example, if you hire a guide or something and you go into a dangerous place and injury results, then um, we would want to avoid that. Um, there are risks associated with eating unfamiliar food in places where hygiene standards are low. Gastric poisoning, for example. Risks associated with running out of money, possibly because your wallet is stolen or something like that. Risks of accidentally causing damage, for example, by driving a vehicle off the road or something. And risks of trespass or incursion or being taken for a spy or goodness knows what. Further risks, being arrested or imprisoned for something, whether or not one is uh, actually culpable, probably not. But we've seen recently, for example, how in the Middle East, um, a researcher doing a, a simple and harmless project was taken as a spy and subject to uh, serious imprisonment, if not torture. So there is a risk that one could be taken for uh, someone who has done something wrong and then uh, incarcerated as a result or whatever happens after that. There are some risks that one could actually be part of a disaster, for example, studying in a seismically active zone and then finding oneself in the midst of an earthquake. Uh, and that is the sort of risk that does occasionally materialise. It happened to me. Uh, likewise with floods, eruptions uh, and transportation crashes. Well, risks of that kind can't be completely eliminated, but they perhaps should be considered. Also, one needs to be careful about cultural transgressions, doing the wrong thing, violating cultural norms, especially where you have rather conservative societies with very strong cultural norms that you are expected to observe. That is merely a question of awareness and doing the right thing. Hopefully one is not going to contract a disease, but one should be careful where contagious and infectious diseases are present, that one has the right vaccinations and one does the right thing regarding the possibility of infection. 
So there you are in the field with kamikaze taxi drivers, unscrupulous merchants trying to rip you off, rickety aircraft floating around the sky, shaky travel agents where you're not sure whether your means of transport is going to turn up or not, diabolical weather, and perhaps even a sudden unexpected coup d'etat or a bombing or something. These are things that can happen. The world is a remarkably unstable place. So what you should do is try to manage the risks associated with field work, and there are forms that the university would expect you to fill in if you're going somewhere exotic, or perhaps even if you're going somewhere well known, in order to be sure that you have taken the idea of risk management seriously. So the first thing you could do is to think the risks through. In the place that I'm going to to do my field work, what happens? What are the risks? You can do some research on what are the possible threats or risks or hazards associated with the place in question. So you can build scenarios. What might happen to me as I go out into the field and I do my work? What do I need to avoid and what do I need to take care over? And in so doing, you can conduct a risk assessment, which is certainly what the form requires of you, and risk assessments for field work are now increasingly the norm. And you can perhaps rank and list the risks and order them by likelihood and consequences, so that the high likelihood risks and those with the biggest consequences uh, take most of your attention. You can consider what has happened in the past, not necessarily to people doing field work, but to people in the area in question. And don't forget to activate travel insurance that will cover you adequately. For example, for work done as part of this university, there is an online form at the UCL website for travel insurance uh, that should be activated every time one goes somewhere where insurance is needed. And if one is overseas, um, at least in some of the more exotic places, it's a good idea to register with one's consulate so that consular officials know that one is there. Right. Now, when you have the list of things that might happen, then it is perhaps a good idea to use a risk matrix or something similar, or at least think it through in these terms, is what may happen likely? Is it very likely or not very likely at all? And if it does happen, are the consequences likely to be negligible, slight, moderate or severe? And of course, for anything with severe consequences or a high likelihood, then the best strategy to do the field work in safety needs to be thought through. That brings us to field work ethics. It is important that when one goes to places with different cultural standards and different practices and traditions, that these be taken account of and observed properly. Otherwise, the result of that may simply, in the lightest cases, be that one is looked at askance and cooperation is withdrawn. In the worst cases, there may be legal consequences resulting in arrest for having done something that is regarded as culturally unacceptable, particularly, for example, with respect to clothing. For example, if you go to Iran as a female, then you cannot go around with your head uncovered. And in fact, quite a few Westerners arrive at Tehran Khomeini Airport and they forget this and they've packed their headscarves in their um, hold baggage and they have to get off the aircraft with one of the airline's blankets over their head because they cannot pass customs until they are properly covered. So that is simply something that needs to be taken account of. And there are, of course, many other behavioural standards that whether or not they are acceptable to you as a researcher, if you want to get your work done and you want to avoid trouble, you have to take them properly into account. So you must ask yourself, what are the local standards of behaviour and local customs that have to be observed when one is there in the field? For example, I spent some time doing research in the villages of Viti Levu, the main island of Fiji, and some of the islands of the Lao group. And 
in that there are definite standards of behaviour because village Fijians are very formal and uh, they're great lovers of ceremony. For example, they do not drink alcohol, although they do drink yangona, which is the kava root. It does have mildly soporific effects, but they drink lots and lots of it, and it really isn't quite like alcohol. They have furniture, but they don't sit on it. They find it uncomfortable, and they find it much more comfortable to sit on the floor. But if you sit on the furniture whilst they are sitting on the floor, then you are putting yourselves above them, which will be regarded as the height of arrogance. You don't uncover your knees. If you have a backpack, you lower it as a sign of respect when you're in the village. You don't leave it on your back. And you treat people according to their rank, with the chief of the village being, of course, the most important person to be deferred to, followed by the village elders. Now, what would happen if you are disrespectful? Well, if you're extremely disrespectful, you might simply be run out of the village. If you're moderately disrespectful, then people will be quite unpleasant to you and they will be uh, unhappy at your behaviour because of its insensitivity. If you are respectful and you show that you understand the customs and the traditions, then you can get on extremely well and will find them tremendously hospitable. And of course, for field work, that is what you need. So, then there are questions of ethical approval of your work. Now, if you're working simply from UCL and you have, for example, a questionnaire, then there are two routes to ethical approval depending on the nature of the questionnaire. If the questionnaire is thoroughly uncontroversial, it does not involve intrusive questions, and you are questioning adults between the age of, say, 18 and 65. And when you've got the answers, they will be treated anonymously. And moreover, you give full information to the people being questioned about their rights, their right to withdraw from the study, for example, and so on. Then you only need departmental level approval, which means going to the UCL Institute for Risk and Disaster Reduction Research Ethics Committee, who can grant approval on seeing the questionnaire and associated documents. If instead you are uh, interviewing, um, for example, vulnerable people, we had uh, a couple of years ago a student who did a thesis on people sleeping rough in a large city. And that will be regarded as uh, questionnaire surveys of vulnerable people. So she had to go through full ethical approval, which involves the UCL level ethics committee uh, looking at the form you've filled in and the questionnaire and any necessary supporting document to verify that you have taken all procedures correctly, uh, all precautions to ensure that uh, you won't... Um, misuse data or give offence. So people with disabilities, elderly people who may have limited um, ability to, uh, limited cognitive ability, uh, children and young people who are under the age of consent and traumatised people and so on are all regarded as vulnerable. And if the results in some way do not guarantee anonymity, that also might be problematic and full ethical approval is required. Now, a lot of ethical approval is for the sort of things we don't do in disaster research, for example, using stem cells or taking samples from people's bodies of blood or plasma or skin or whatever. So we don't need to worry about some of those technical aspects, but we do need to consider when we're using questionnaire research what's in the questionnaire and who are the respondents. So what questions are you asking if you have a questionnaire? Is there any semblance of intimate personal information there? Is there anything that could be used to identify the interviewee that might get the interviewee into trouble in some way? Have you fully anonymised the results of the questionnaire so that when they fill in the form or answer your questions verbally, they cannot be identified from what you've written down or recorded? Have you done the right thing regarding this uh, with respect to consent? For example, they have been informed fully of their rights. If you're making recordings of a conversation, 
that they have given their full consent for the conversation to be recorded and so on. And in short, anything that might upset the person being interviewed has to be thought, thought through uh, and dealt with before the data collection campaign starts. So you wouldn't wish to put interviewees at risk, and above all, we wouldn't wish to see a reprisal from interviewees who would argue perhaps with um, legal threats that what you've done is in some way wrong or has caused harm or damage. So we trust that most questionnaire surveys will be entirely harmless. They will produce good and useful results without having to um, cause any problems for those who've contributed to the work. So you certainly won't be asking questions like, excuse me, are you the mo a member of the local mafia or have you ever murdered someone? And essentially then when you do your research and also above all when you plan it, do so with prudence, care and foresight. <laughs>